Also, if you have any questions throughout the talk, please put them in the chat box and we will be monitoring the chat and we'll ask those, um, we'll answer those questions. So if there's anything that's in ambiguous or confusing, please put it in the chat. If we need any clarification, we might ask you to unmute, but otherwise we ask that you please stay muted. And um, if anyone isn't muted, we might mute you just so that the background noise um, doesn't distract any of the viewers or the speakers. So that's it for housekeeping. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. I, at this point, am going to hand it over to Shelly McComb at Huey C. Grant. Hello, thank you all for being here. My name is Shelly McComb. I'm the Coastal Resilience Specialist with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Sea Grant, and we are hosting this My Coast app training as part of our Cape Cod Coastal Resilience Week. So I can put a link to that in the chat for you all, but we encourage you to come out and attend some of our other events if you're able to. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca Haney and Julia Neisel from the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. We are so excited that they are here today. So take it away. Thank you, Shelley. So we are very pleased to be here and offer this training today. The um, My Coast is something that we um, are very proud of. Um, in terms of how we can document the observations of flooding and erosion along the coast. You can go on to the next slide. So there's um, a tr outline of the training. We're gonna be talking about, um, do some introductions at the beginning and talk about, um, we wanna understand where all of you are from and what your interests are. Talk about the coastal storm damage and king tides uh, observations and reports that we've been getting. Um, talk about the storm team and the community reporters that have been helping us gather observations. Um, also talking about the, the applications of the MyCoast data, how it's used and how it benefits um, a lot of different purposes. And when to report, what some of the definitions are that we use. Um, we'll do some question and answer, have a short break so that you can download the app, and we're going to do a demonstration of the, the app, talk about some of the other tools in my coast beyond the, the one we use for Storm Reporter and for King Tides. Um, we're going to talk about those other tools and then um, have a demonstration of the online platform. So we really appreciate your attending today, and we'll go to the next slide. Okay, I should have introduced myself. Sorry, I'm Grace Simpkins and I'm with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Sea Grant, just like Shelley. So we have a few poll questions because we know there are a lot of people in the room and you might be interested in knowing um, who else is attending and it also helps us to be informed um, as to what information might be the best. So the first uh, poll question is very simple. <laughs> it's uh, what is your affiliation and you can click more than one. So we just ask that you please click on it. If you're on a touch screen device, you just touch it. If you're on a, um, a device with a mouse, you just click on it and I'll share the results in just a, um, a couple of seconds. I get to see who's participated. So make sure you cast your vote because I'll see if you didn't. No, I don't know who it is. Um, okay, I'm gonna wait just a few more seconds. And again, if you fall within multiple affiliations, you can feel free to click multiple things. But I think everyone has answered at this point. So I'll just share the results. You can see there that um, the majority are coastal community residents. And then we also have nonprofit organiza organizations, academia, local officials, board members, and state agency staff. And then... Um, others, if you could please specify in the chat, if you fall within that other category, um, just let us know where you're from. That'd be great. Okay. So next question is, um, let's see, I wanna, are you a member of the Massachusetts Coastal Storm Damage Assessment Team? Again, I'm just gonna wait. Oh, this is quick. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and again, I'll share the results. So 26 of you are um, not and three of you are. Right. And then 
then the next question is, let me just stop sharing, is have you submitted a MyCoast report? Sort of fun to watch the watch it populate. You all are super quick. I appreciate that. All right, I'm going to share the results. So 13 of you have, yes, and 22 of you have not. All right, one last question, and then I promise the polling is over. Um, but this has two parts to it. So the first part is, have you used MyCoast data slash photos? And then the second part is, we would like to know how. And there is also a write-in there as well. So if you um, want to specify in the chat, if you've used it in a way that we did not list, that'd be really helpful for us. So please put that in the chat. And I'll give everyone a little bit of time to fill this out since there are multiple pieces. A couple more. All right. Perfect. Okay. So let me just share those results with you. So seven of you said yes, you've used MyCoast data photos or photos. Um, 28 of you said no. And you can see that um, how it's been used varied. So three of you used real-time awareness, three for planning, three for project siding and design, one for a grant proposal. And then in the chat, um, I see someone put social media and um, I think the other, uh, I think that's all I see in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it back over to our speakers. Thank you for participating in the polls. Thank you, Grace. It's really helpful to understand who's here and, and who's familiar with the app and has used it. So we really appreciate that. now I'm going to talk about some of the reports and the types of damages that are being reported. So during coastal storms, um, one of the frequent um, reports that we get is um, flooding of low-lying coastal roads. Uh, this is usually one of the first um, impacts from coastal storms that we start to see, and it depends on the severity of the storm as to what the, um, the level of flooding is and how far inland that extends. Next. We also um, will see the, the flooding start to have uh, flow and water get around houses and other buildings along the shoreline. That's um, another common in, particularly in low-lying areas, we'll start to see that. And then for piers, wharfs, um, docks, we'll start to see some of those um, that are out in the water have the water creeping up. Um, so it's not just under the, the wharf itself, but starting to affect the building. And we see overwash of sediment onto coastal roads um, as the beach and dunes are eroded and that water comes over that's washing sediment onto the roadways. And with the, the velocity of water, sometimes there's um, under erosion or undermining of coastal roads um, that um, causes them to get washed out um, and lose sections of the pavement so they're um, impassable. Once we get more erosion along the coast, there can be um, damage to um, houses that are on uh, more solid foundations that, that start to collapse onto the beach. That's usually in the more significant events or in areas where they've had a lot of erosion threatening some of the older houses. And we also see coastal bank erosion, which can um, be significant in some areas and get back closer to buildings, um, you see the tree that came down the bank that was up on top. So there's um, constant movement of that um, as, as the erosion continues as well. 
we can see um, changes in barrier islands and barrier spit where there's new um, inlet formed, um, particularly in Chatham and Egertown. Um, that has happened in the recent past. So that's one of those situations where you have that new inlet right in the middle of the screen there that's formed and it used to be a, a barrier that went straight across. We also have the King Tide tool in the app, and that's documenting the extent of the flooding that's happening during the extra high tides we have. Those are King Tides. So this is Plymouth Rock that's um, starting to get um, submerged during this King Tide. And King Tides are what happens as the moon is orbiting the Earth when it is um, closest um, in alignment with the, the sun, moon, and earth is when we have the highest tides. So that typically happens when we have a new moon, as you can see in the top, or a full moon at the bottom. And so that is a seasonal occurrence. Um, and so those spring tides, we do have spring and neap tides every month, um, but it depends on the alignment of the moon and the sun and the earth as to when we see those extra high tides during the year. So documenting the effects of those is really helpful um, to see the extent of the flooding. So the Massachusetts Coastal Storm Damage Assessment Team um, was formed after Hurricane Bob to help improve the real-time awareness of moderate to major coastal storms. Um, we wanted to have a way of getting that information quickly um, after storm events. So we uh, formed this team and there's a network of trained local, state and federal staff that collect and report observations of flooding, erosion and any damage to buildings and infrastructure um, after the high tides during storm events. We currently have about 84 members of the storm team that cover 51 communities. And we do need additional members to help expand our coverage and there'll be more about that later. So the, the tool development is something that we've worked on to help with um, in improving our reporting and the information that we're getting. So in 2009, there was a, a standardized online form that was created. Um, in 2011, it was developed it, to expand it to cover more of New England. And in 2013, we we're able to launch the mobile apps so that we can get that information real time from the field even quicker, makes it um, very quick to get the information from folks and as well as the pictures. So pictures says a thousand words um, in helping convey the impacts. So our the reports um, we've activated for some of the major events like Hurricane Sandy, Winter Storm Nemo in 2013, as well as the, the March Nor'easters in 2018, well, the January and the March. But these have been some pretty significant events, and we also try to document some of those moderate level events as well. We also are looking for community reporters to help us um, with um, particularly documenting the um, king tides, the extent of the flooding during these king tides can be a really powerful tool in communicating the effects of sea level rise and how the tides are reaching higher over time. The advantages of having some community reporters um, being out there to do this is that they're there, they live in the communities, you have easier access, um, you're able to report more frequently um, because folks are out walking anyway, looking at the shoreline, enjoying the area. Um, and you're familiar with the area and the changes that are occurring over time. So that having those reporters is definitely helping to improve our, our documenting. So we want to make sure everybody is doing it when they're safe, um, not driving through flood water. Um, make sure it's during the daylight. If there's a great king tide at night, we're just, we don't want to be out there in, in the dark. So we'll talk about a little more on tips later. But we have um, since 2011, when we launched the um, the online tool between the storm team and the community reporters, they've submitted over 8,217 reports with 17,106 photographs. So we're building an amazing database um, that is used for a lot of different purposes.
So some of those, those reasons that we use the data are the types of uses that we have for emergency response and recovery. It helps us identify the level of impact, um, the extent of the impact, and provide information directly to uh, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, State Emergency Operations Center, where all the agencies are gathered in a storm event to um, coordinate the, the response so that if in there's significant impacts that they can provide the state or federal resources in a, a timely manner. This doesn't replace the community reporting emergency managers to MEMA directly. Um, this is supplementing that and it's been a really helpful tool um, for all the agencies who get that information real time. It also helps verify the impacts um, in multi-tide storms uh, for the weather service. It helps them with fine tuning their forecasts for the next couple tides, helps with forecasting future events. As some of these weather patterns are changing, these reports are even more helpful to them to see what's actually going on. Um, our, our shoreline is not straight and simple. It's relatively convoluted. So it's not always the easiest uh, to forecast. So this is really helpful for them. We also use the information for planning and project review. When we're reviewing a project and someone's saying the water doesn't get up there, it's helpful to have a database to go back and look at in addition to having projected uh, flood zones on maps. It's also good to see what's actually been going on. So we also use it for scientific studies. If we're um, developing inundation maps, looking at erosion models, um, trying to see what's happened or seeing the actual impacts in storms for different levels of storms is very helpful to ground truth that. Um, being able to calibrate and validate a model is essential to getting um, good results. Next. So when the Weather Service issues their hazardous weather outlook, um, it talks about the kind of impacts that, that are likely to happen. And one of those um, for coastal storms is what level of flooding. So for minor coastal flooding, um, the impacts that we're most likely to see are those flooding of, of low-lying roads. And so this is, um, if we can go to the next slide. You, we want to make sure that you are out there reporting only when it's safe. Um, so whether it's flooding or splash over from seawalls, there can be debris in the flood water, and we want to make sure that people are safe. Um, so the you need to you know take that um, that ability to to be out there and, and documenting things with a, a grain of salt and make sure you're being safe. So the, the definition for minor coastal flooding is when you have mostly of those low-lying shore roads or some low-lying areas where basements are getting flooded. Um, the majority of roads are still passable. This is the National Weather Service definition of what a, a minor coastal flood um, would entail. So that's when we would see the minor uh, road flooding that we showed before. Next. And we would start to see um, splash over of seawalls. So that's when you do have the waves hitting a seawall, have that reflection of water and starting to have splash over. It's the water splashing over the wall itself. And so you'll get that splash over onto roads um, or houses or whatever is directly landward of the seawall. And there can be overwash of uh, beach sediment and dune sediment onto coastal roads. This is a paved road um, in Falmouth, um, but this is overwash of the sediment from the, the storm event. So we also ask people to report what um, Response activity is going on. So in this case, there's quite a bit of sediment that's overwashed onto the road. Not all of our beaches are sandy. So in this case, it's more of the cobble and gravel. And there's road clearing that's going on in, um, with the town trying to address the, the overwash. Then we get into the, the moderate category of impacts. And so the Weather Service um, definition of moderate um, flooding is when you do have widespread 
uh, flooding of vulnerable shore roads and basements, um, and you're starting to get more road closures as needed. It's uh, a wider area that's being affected um, and very vulnerable structure, structures such as docks, houses, decks, porches that are in close proximity to the seawalls or low-lying areas can start to be affected. You can start to see some structural damage. Next. So if you, this is an example of a roadway that's getting uh, ripped up. So instead of just flooding of the road, we're getting the pavement torn up uh, or washed out. Next. And we do um, see more erosion of beach and dunes in the moderate events, which can lead to some undermining of houses. We also see that beach and dune erosion leading to undermining of seawalls. And this is something that you wouldn't see when you're out there at the peak of the storm. You would have to see that after, um, once the water is subsided, um, then we can see what the impacts are to the, the structures. But this has completely undermined the base of the seawall with the erosion. It can also expose a lot of different things when beaches and dunes erode. Um, this um, septic system components were in the dune uh, before the storm, and those are now uh, out on the beach um, as a result of all the erosion that occurred. We also see piers and docks damaged, and that can have um, be a structural damage, and some of that debris can be carried to other areas. Um, so documenting that those impacts is still important. And as I mentioned, directly adjacent to seawalls, when you have that splash over, you can also see damage to decks and porches. So we're trying to document the level of impacts and you can see an increasing impact as we go from minor to moderate um, in the category of storms. And then when we get into major coastal storms, you're looking at um, more significant widespread flooding of vulnerable shore roads, basements, damage to homes that um, not just uh, minor damage, but getting into some actual destruction, um, loss of the homes. Um, but it, it, it's usually a more widespread event um, to be categorized major. And they are considering uh, a severe category as well um, for their forecasting. So when you get into an, an event like that, the destruction can be a lot more significant um, and widespread, such as the blizzard of 78. Um, thankfully, we haven't had one of those in quite a while, um, but we have had some, um, some moderate level events that have done quite a bit of damage. So we can see overwash of beaches and dunes. Um, and in some cases, the overwash doesn't form a new inlet. In some cases, it does. So the difference is in um, reporting that you would um, just talk about overwash of a barrier versus a, a breached barrier, depending if a new inlet actually formed um, and stayed. This, this picture is showing overwash, but that did actually form a breach in that storm. So the, the long duration coastal event can really increase the impact. Um, when we see the forecasts come from the National Weather Service, one of the things we look for is how many tides are they expecting us to get impacts? The more tides um, we have with impact, the greater the impact. So this is the, the hydrograph um, showing the, the orange is the minor flood level category, the moderate is the um, the orange, I'm sorry, the um, more closer to orangish red in the middle there is the moderate flood level category and then the purple is the major. And in the March 2018 storms in the beginning of March, we had uh, the first week, um, the town of Situate talked about the tide not going out for the first seven tide cycles. And you can see, you know, that the, the moderate um, impacts that they were getting. Um, and, and even though the, 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 four, the fifth and fourth and fifth tides were in the minor category because they had already had so much erosion and flooding and the tides were staying in and not really receding, they had a lot more impacts. And so the duration of the storm, as well as the level of flooding 
and the wave field offshore make a big difference in what we expect to see in terms of impact. Any questions at this point in the, the presentation about what we've presented so far? Feel free to put your questions in the chat. There are no silly questions. Happy to clarify anything. All right, I'm not, not seeing any questions at this point. Um, we can always talk about questions um, later. I just wanted to make sure that we gave you a chance to talk about it while it was fresh in your mind. So we're gonna take a, a quick break. Um, and one of the things we'd like you to do is make sure you have the app downloaded onto your phone during the break. Um, so that you can be using that when we get to one of the exercises um, later on. So it's um, the My Coast app. It's My Coast, all one word, with the wave. So please download that on your phone. And if you could come back um, 135. And if you think of any burning questions, we can cover those then.
Rebecca, there is a question in the Q and A. So Helen, we will be posting this presentation um, so that so the the impacts that we see, we're documenting the impacts of the storms, um, but also um, the seeing the fact that as erosion is occurring, we are seeing the impacts shifting uh, landward over time. Mm -hmm. So places that used to have a wide dune system protecting them have been, you know, gradually losing that over time. So they have been less and less protection and sea level is also rising, which means the impact of a storm that may not have reached as far inland before is getting further, further landward. So that um, those the damages and the impacts that we're seeing, it, it's helping to document that um, for a variety of purposes um, for to, to see that the impacts of sea level rise, to um, provide that information to Lima and FEMA so they can make decisions about disaster assistance. There's a lot of different uh, reasons why we do that. And the impacts of the King Tides, just seeing some of your local landmarks um, and how those are being flooded and how that's increasing is really helpful in, in local um, education and outreach on the impacts of sea level rise. Okay, so we're gonna transition to the demo part of our training. We hope you had an opportunity to either download the app prior to the training or during the break. I'd like to recognize the two consultants that developed the app. We have Blue Urchin Consulting um, on board with the, the training today. So uh, Chris and Wes, hello, thanks for joining us. As Rebecca said, we worked with Blue Urchin to develop Android and iPhone apps to make reporting easier for the storm team, but also to make reporting more accessible to other partners as well. And we are going to walk through submitting a report. When you launch the app, I'm using screenshots from an Android, iPhones are very similar. You can see some information about the tool including the most recent version. When you're going out to report, you definitely want to make sure that you check for any app updates if you don't have those installing automatically. In the upper left corner of the app screen, there's little waves. If you click on those little waves, you get a menu of options including going to the home screen with a, a tie gauge, adding a report directly from the menu, customizing some settings, looking at tide stations that are nearby that's not your default station, going in to see some other tide data, and there's a live stream of reports that then link you to the full reports on the online platform. And what I want to walk through is going to the home screen. This gives you a sense of where you are in the tidal stage. If um, you're going out to report a king tide, for instance, you want to wait until about an hour on either side of the peak of high tide to make sure you're capturing the maximum extent of inundation. However, when you're going out during a storm event or immediately after a storm event, you wanna check the tide chart to make sure that you're going out at a safe time when you'll be able to access locations that may still have um, inundation. I wanna call your attention to a toggle that's at the bottom of the screen. You can choose to share your location with us. So Rebecca and I manage the storm team and on the admin side of the tool, if you choose to share your location with us during a storm, 
we can have a better sense of our coverage across the coast. And it also gives us an opportunity to be able to reach out to you if we need some additional information. So we encourage you to do turn on that toggle. You can turn it off after you're done reporting for the day. You don't need to leave it turned on so that we don't see your position um, at other times. Now let's go ahead and add a report. As Rebecca mentioned, we have four tools that are in the app. The Storm Reporter, which is the first tool that we launched, King Tides, a coastal resilience tool, and then also there's a beach profiling tool in here that the Stone Living Lab uh, worked on to get some citizen science data, primarily in the Boston Harbor area. One tool that you don't see on here that we'll talk about later is the Coast Snap tool, and that's purposeful. The Coast Snap tool wasn't included in the app in order to allow people to share photos without registering. So when you see a cradle at a Coast Snap location, there'll be a QR code there that you can use to get to the website to share your photos. So that's the only tool on the MyCoast platform that doesn't use the app. Let's go ahead and walk through a storm report since that is the primary use of the MyCoast platform for our office. Once you click on the storm report button, you're presented with the first page of the report. In here, we ask you to enter a common name for the location where you're reporting. So the beach name, the neighborhood, a, a landmark, something to help orient people to the location of your report. And then you have two options. You can take a photo live, or if the weather's inclement, you can get out of your car, take some photos with your cell phone, run back to the car, and then you can start your report and select from the photos that are stored on your phone. So whatever you're comfortable with, either take photos live while you're using the app, or you can select from photos that you previously took and saved onto your phone, whatever you choose. So moving to the next step, so step two here, we can automatically populate the date and time of the, the photo. If it's wrong for some reason, you can go in and adjust that. But then the most important thing is to toggle the impacts to report button so that you then see all of the categories of reports that um, we would like you to look for. So these are the major categories. We developed the tool to not only look at the impacts to beach systems, so the natural resources, but the coastal infrastructure that's you know, trying to control erosion and flooding, so the seawalls and bulkheads, and then also the impacts to the roads back behind the beach systems, the homes, the businesses, and also the kind of working waterfront infrastructure, recreational boating infrastructure, as well as any hazardous materials that you might see, whether that is, you know, oil or gas, or some other type of contaminant as a result of the storm. Let's look at the options under impacts to natural resources. When you toggle the impacts to natural resources, these are the options. We have everything from those minor impacts that Rebecca talked about, including you know, damaged sand fencing and beach and dune erosion, and then working our way up to, you know, overwash of beach and dunes, breached barrier beaches. And then we're also looking at what's happening on the backside of beach systems. Are we seeing rack being moved about on our salt marshes? So this report, let's submit a minor report. So we're just seeing some damaged sand fencing and, and beach erosion. We're not even seeing 
dune erosion yet. It's just that minor uh, impact of the sand fencing at the toe of the dune. So we go to the next step. Let's explore the impacts to buildings. Let's see if there's something there. So if you do see uh, a building that was damaged, we are asking you to input, input the nearest street name so that if we need to follow up, especially if the State Emergency Operations Center is activated, we'll be able to further investigate the situation and potentially support any kind of response efforts whether it's you know going out to to stabilize or uh, assist local emergency managers in some other way so in this situation we are seeing some damaged stairs and decks that are over the dune and then there is some water flow around the buildings that are closest to the, the beach. And then we didn't have any other categories of impacts. So we go to the final step and we check our location. If you have your geolocation turned on your phone, which most people keep their location on, it'll automatically drop the pin in your location if for some reason the storm is impacting your geolocation or you have it turned off, you have the opportunity to go and move your pin. You can zoom in and out on the map. You can toggle between this map view and a satellite view in order to refine your position. So go ahead and manipulate the map however you need to to get that pin in as accurate as a location as you can so that we can have those photos pinpoint it down to where you're seeing those impacts. I want to also call your attention to the acknowledgement under the map. By participating in the MyCoast effort, you are authorizing us to be able to use your photos and presentations, reports, and you know, in the State Emergency Operations Center, in outreach products. So Share freely, acknowledge that. We thank you and um, really appreciate everything that we receive. And then finally, when you submit, you can then check the live stream of reports to make sure that your report successfully uploaded. If you go on the online platform and look for your report, through the search tool at this point, there might be a delay because we have a system in Massachusetts where Rebecca and I and a few other administrators actually look at each and every report when they're submitted to check for accuracy. And we then either make corrections, reach out to the reporter to clarify anything, or we go ahead and approve that report. So we want you to know that we received your report, you'll get an acknowledgement email, but you might not see your report immediately on the online system, depending on the volume of reports that we're going through and approving. So if you do click on that live stream button in the app, you'll see a list of the most recent reports. Thank you to the, all the CoSNAP people that are getting out in this nice weather. <laughs> When you click on one of those buttons for the view report, you're going to leave the app and go to the online platform to see the, the full report. So does anyone have any questions about the app at this point? We've, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Um, okay, let's so go through them. One was asking that she didn't see the, the beach profile um, report. Uh, or that option in the app. Um, it's not showing up on my screen in the app right now either. I'll check on that. Me, um, is, are you using an iPhone or an Android? But it's in the Apple. Okay, that could be a difference between, so I'm using Android. Okay, we can follow up on that. And um, 
somebody mentioned that they're having a password problem. So you need to make sure if you change your password that you change it in the app as well as in the um, in the web browser. You want to change it in both places. Um, and there is a, a link for assistance. It looks like one of the developers already responded. He's he's working on fixing that for you. Um, so they are very helpful in responding to to password help if that automatic help password forgotten um, button doesn't work for you. Um, so yeah, there's no, um, she commented that there's no beach um, profile beta tool on her iPhone. It's not showing up on my Android right right now either. Um, Chris, did you wanna respond to that? Is that hidden on the the iPhones while you're doing an upgrade or is that something that the living lab requested um truthfully i've got no idea at all but we'll get into it um, okay hey uh this is why i'm still here too that that was requested only to be revealed to certain people they wanted to keep it closed so julie oh, okay. you were on that list of people who can see it so the general public cannot yet well, no, thanks I'm, guys apparently i'm general sure. public too so darn um anyway let's see do we have any other questions right now at this point Okay. Well, I think we have some great examples we're going to move on to. Yes. We want to test your ability to read the landscape. So we want to just pause for a moment and just have you focus on this photograph. Think about the categories that we talked about. Everything from, you know, erosion and flooding to impacts to roads and buildings infrastructure, hazardous materials, and think about what you would report for this photo. And if anyone is willing, they can put their observations in the chat to share with others. What impacts are people seeing in this picture? Is anyone willing to share in the chat? Okay, Denise. Okay, good. Those hidden damages are tricky, mm -hmm. which is why Rebecca mentioned that you may have to go back out to your site a second time when the floodwaters recede so you can get the full picture of the impacts to the infrastructure and the elevation of the landform as well. Okay, we're, we're seeing some consensus here. And Laura, thank you for pointing out that rack on the marsh there. And Grace, we definitely appreciate the growing risk associated with sea level rise. And that's why it's very important to get these impacts documented now. So we have a point of comparison so that we can show that increasing change over time. All right, so the major impacts that Rebecca and I wanted to point out here are um, the road flooding, and you can see that the water is moving. So you should not be driving through this. So you would check off that the road was impassable due to that flood water. And there is also that pile up of the rack on and adjacent to the road in the wetland area. So you would check off that as well. But we don't know um, about the underlying surface of the road at this point since it's covered. So you would need to go back after the flooding receded to see if the road itself was washed out or there were some other damages to the roads. Any question on this one before we move to the next example? Okay, I think we're good. All right, here's example number two. Take a moment, think about what you would report here.
Go ahead Would anyone be driving chat. that white car? <laughs> Denise has the right answer. <laughs> it does. What else do we see for impacts? Good observation. There you go. Casey's got it. Okay, so we just want to point out that the floodwaters are up the axle of that car, and we would deem that impassable due to floodwaters. If this road was leading to your ultimate de destination for reporting, if the beach that you typically report on is at the end of this road, you would also check out, check off that the beach or shoreline was inaccessible so that we know that we haven't gotten a full picture here because you weren't able to get down to your reporting location. And then we also wanna point out what, would, what was um, featured in the comments is that there is water flow around those buildings. We can't get up close to the buildings to see if there's any damage to the foundations, but at a minimum, we wanna make sure that we note that existence of the flood water around or under the buildings. And again, this is another location that would need to be investigated after the floodwaters recede to see if there is some significant damage to those homes or the underlying roadway or other infrastructure. Good job, everyone on that. Let's do another example. This is a little different. So we have a situation here where the water is not up as high. What do you all see? Laura's using binoculars to see in the distance here because access is restricted. Okay, these are all great observations. You're all on track. So let's go ahead and, and point a few things out. So as you all noted, there is overwash onto this road. You can see it, it is starting to recede, but there is some active overwash still happening. And there is definite evidence of beach and dune erosion that material that's on the road was eroded from the fronting beach and dune system and you can actually see the the scarping on the dune and you can see where um, some plows have come through to try and clear the road earlier and if you look in the distance there behind those two white vehicles you can actually see that the response efforts are ongoing we're not sure about um, any utility impacts because we can't get down there to investigate, but it would be something that you could note if you suspect that that is the case. So we encourage you to always take advantage of the comment boxes when you're reporting, just to give us a full picture of what you see. Now we're going to move on to recapping some tips. 
for when you're going out to report on coastal storm damages. As I mentioned before, if you don't have your app auto updating, you definitely want to go into your app store and check that before you go out so that if there were any bugs that were resolved, that that's all taken care of and you have full functionality. And if your password isn't saved in your app, make sure you put that in also before you go out. And if you, then you have time to go ahead and reset it if you need to. Rebecca mentioned that we don't want people going out in the dark. It doesn't make for a good photo and it's dangerous. So make sure you are out there in daylight when you can see all potential hazards and watch out for high winds. You could lose a car door if you're opening your door when there's a strong gust. So we don't want that to happen. And sea foam can come out of nowhere <laughs> and catch you off guard. And the winds can also pick up other debris that's out along the site. So be safe, watch out for all those things. In addition to the winds, the splash over and waves also carry sand, gravel, cobble, and other material from the beach. And it also any other debris, fencing, docks, that sort of thing, any other materials from houses can also get carried over. So watch out for nails. You don't wanna be driving through floodwaters. You don't wanna be driving over overwash. We don't want people um, having damage to car tires and other things. So be safe. And like I mentioned before, th when we were doing the photo exercise, if you can't get to your ultimate destination, let us know, submit a, submit a report for as far as you can get and add in the comments that you couldn't access your beach and go back later when the tide has come down or when the area is cleared and you can access to see what's happened in terms of the erosion and potential infrastructure damages. If you're going out during a winter storm, make sure you charge your phone fully and bring your charger with you in the car. Because I don't know if you've been out walking and um, taking a lot of pictures in the winter time, but your battery can drain really fast. And one tip is to put the phone in your inside pocket of your jacket while you're out there, just to keep it as warm as you can to preserve that battery life. Rebecca would also advise you to bring standard notepad and pencil to write things down if you do have a, a cell phone failure. You can always uh, call us later, or submit a report later if you do note those uh, locations and observations in the more traditional way. And I mentioned when we were going through the screenshots of the app that you can um, check on your uploading status. Don't fear that your report will be lost. It'll just um, kind of be paused, if you will, until you get to a location where you have better cell reception, and then the report will fully upload. And then finally, I just want to remind you again that Rebecca and I are going through and reviewing reports before they're approved. And if you do think of something that you want to change in your report before we get a chance to approve it, go ahead into that email confirmation that you get. And there's a link on there that you can use to, to access your report. There's one more you skipped. Which one, Rebecca? So when you, if you're out and it's either raining, snowing, windy, you can take your photos and then go back to your car um, and enter the reports that way so that you don't have to do it out in the, 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 the really fun weather that we out, end up out in. Okay, great. Yep, the app allows that. We have live photo taking as well as uploading the photos that are stored on your phone. Okay. So at this point, we wanna pause and encourage 
any local officials or state officials that are still with us on the training to, to reach out if you are willing to be an official member of the storm team and be on our roster um, that gets called on when we need to go into the state emergency operations center. This is, as Rebecca noted, a different level of participation than going out independently and reporting impacts. The reason why we can only have public officials on our storm team is because of liability purposes. You would be reporting in your official government capacity when you're on the, the storm team. So if you are not officially a member of the storm team and you are eligible and interested, please email Rebecca. That's our plug for today. Let's actually a question in the chat okay. um, about um, somebody that's noticed damage um, from the winter storms, whether they could still um, enter that and have it be reported. So it depends on on the how long ago it's been. Um, it's it's tough to say, you know, what the um, you know, when you submit the, the photo now, it's going to have today's date and time. So it'd be a little difficult to, to document when what storm that was from. But it's also good. Um, it's it's still good to document that you're noticing impacts um, some, from something that's changed. So thank you for that. So Helen also asks, how do people know if their town is being reported in the storm team? So you can, um, the, Julia is actually going to show you how to search reports um, a little further down here, and you can see um, where reports are being entered for. You're also more than welcome to email Rebecca and myself, and we can also check the roster and let you know if you want to be in coordination with that individual or support that individual or potentially fill a gap because we actually do have quite a few communities on the cape and also the islands where we could use some additional coverage all right at this point we want you to grab your cell phone and open up the my coast app For folks that aren't playing along, just um, sit tight. <laughs> we want you to do a King Tide report using the app. So take a photo of this, the photo on the screen and you'll need to adjust the location to Long Wharf in Boston. So we want you to get practice manipulating the map to maneuver your pin around. This is a king tide report, so you're not expected to click on any observations. This is not a storm report. So we want you to go ahead and do that. Once you successfully submit a report, put done in the chat or submit it or something like that so we know how much more time you need. Rebecca, you can also monitor the, uh, the unapproved reports online. Chris, Helen needs help. I'm on it. I actually already sent her an email. Helen, did you check your email? She's got some sort of password manager that's messing around with my Chris, but we can work it out. Ah. I'm used to using a password manager and it's very helpful for me. And the app generates 
con an email for me and there's no way for me to save it for myself. And so I don't know what it is next time. And it just, it's ongoing. Like it, it, I, he solved it briefly for me in the winter, but it's just, it's, I just, it makes it impossible to use the app basically. I guess you're just going to have to start writing your passwords on a piece of paper and hiding it in your office. But it's the gen ones his app generates are so complicated that um, I can't <laughs> write them down. <laughs> I managed all my other passwords for a million other apps, and this does not work. Okay, I, I sent you an email. Let, let's carry on in there. Okay. All right, a few people have gotten their reports submitted. Rebecca, do you want to check those? Look at the locations, see how people are doing? Okay, two entered for Long Wharf in Boston. Rebecca and I will not be approving these reports, we're going to delete them after the training. So don't be surprised if you don't see them showing up in your account. I got one that's right on Long Wharf. Is anyone having difficulty? Because we can move on if, if people are all set. Yeah, both right on Long Wharf. Well, that one's right. close. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left, so we're going to move on. Yep. And we just want to walk through some tips for the king tides, which are a little bit different than the storm reports. So as I mentioned before, we want you to get out at the peak of the high tide for a king tide so that you can capture the maximum impact from that king tide and we need some reference point for these photos you can see an example here where we have a bulkhead adjacent to a sidewalk and we also have a landmark uh, restaurant and condo development and you can see where the water is relative to the windows on that building so it's a good marker of the, the magnitude of the impact of this king tide. And you're also welcome, like in the previous photo, to include people. They're very useful for scale, so you can see the depth of water. But please take the picture from behind or ask their permission, since these photos are going to be shared publicly. We want to make sure that we give people that courtesy. Okay. Now we want to just highlight two other tools in the MyCoast system. So we've covered Storm Reporter and King Tides. So now Coastal Resilience. This is a tool that we developed in 2018 to be able to document monitoring of shoreline restoration projects for coastal resilience. So we at CZM administer a coastal resilience grant program and fund restoration of beaches and dunes, fringing salt marsh restoration projects, coastal bank stabilization, and communities that receive funding through our grant program use this tool to track how the materials are holding up over time, if adjustments need to be made, they are also looking at the expansion of vegetative cover over the site and any other kind of um, features that would allow us to evaluate the success of the project and be able to inform future projects. And um, that's all I'll say about that for right now. So now the most recent tool in the MyCoast portfolio is CoSnap. I'm going to pass it to Brian at Sea Grant to talk about CoSnap. Yeah, thanks. So uh, CoSnap is, again, the most recent tool in the MyCoast family. 
and it's used to uh, keep track of shoreline position and beach width. And it's used not just during episodic events, like we're seeing with the other tools, um, where you have a big storm come in or a really big tide. This is something that we want to use all the time throughout the year. Basically, anytime you see one, if you go take a photo for us, it'd be great. But they are uh, phone cradles that are at places like Town Neck Beach in Sandwich and State Beach in Oak Bluffs. Uh, we also have one at Hummock Pond Road in Nantucket. And this cradle allows anybody who goes to it to take pretty much the exact same photo from the exact same spot every time. And so when Rebecca was talking about uh, verifying models and helping build um, you know, these coastal tools that we need, having this photo in the exact same spot every time really helps us out. And so it's great that you can go up and like Julia mentioned, you don't necessarily need the app to uh, submit one of these photos. So you can go up, scan a QR code, and then submit the photo without having to log in. So hopefully no troubles there. But it gives us that uh, just day over day change that we see in the coastal systems rather than just the big changes from storms. And once you submit these photos, uh, they come to us here at Hui Sea Grant. We go through them, make sure they look good. And then they're actually composed into a time lapse photo so that we can see that change little by little over time. And I'll throw a link in the chat right now to our website where you can go in and uh, see some of these time lapses for yourself. And uh, if you ever see a CoSnap post, feel free to uh, you know run up, scan the QR code, snap a photo, send it in. It really helps us out. And hopefully we'll be expanding to other locations fairly soon. That'd be great, Brian. Okay, at this point, we're gonna take the remaining roughly, um, well, let's say five minutes or so to walk you through searching reports using the online platform. So that's a capability that you don't have on the app. And then we'll wrap up with any final questions. So I'm gonna exit this presentation and bring up the app. One moment. Okay. So if you go to mycoast.org forward slash MA, you are at the Massachusetts landing page for my coast. I will recognize that there's a number of other states that have been added to the my coast platform. And if you are traveling or have friends in other states, feel free to participate in those other state efforts. But we're focused on Massachusetts at the moment. So if you want to search reports either from uh, a particular beach location or you're curious what was the extent of impacts from a particular storm event, you need to go up to the top menu bar to Storm Reporter and you'll see some drop down options and you want to go down to search reports. When you go to search reports, you're presented with an interactive map a number of filtering options on the left side, and then a list of all of the reports. If you wanna narrow this down, because you can see that currently we have 8,163 reports populated here, you can either zoom in on the map to a location Let's go to sandwich, for instance, here. We got a lot of reports there. The other um, thing I'll point out is that there's a button here on the lower left side of the map. Once you zoom into your area of interest, go ahead and click that button to enable map filtering. 
And you'll narrow down the number of reports based on that geographic area. So you can see that we've now gone down to 507 reports for this geographic area. And you are welcome to filter by date. So Rebecca had mentioned that 2018 was an active season. So you can go into start date and if you click on the year, you can double click and you can use these arrows to scroll back in time. So you can go back to 2018, for instance, and go to January 1st. And then to narrow the reports down, you can set an end date. So you can go back to 2018 and let's set it for the end of March to get all of the reports for this area within that time window. So you can see that the list updated. So we have 32 reports now for this area for that time period. And feel free to navigate the map further, or you can actually scroll down and look at the thumbnails and the locations and dates and times and see which reports you might be interested in. So let's look at this report from March 13th at Spring Hill Beach. So you click on it and it brings up the, the full report. And the value in looking at the full reports is you also get all of the NOAA tide gauge information and weather information that is corresponding with this report and photo. So if you scroll down, you can see that the person got out there at low tide that you can see the full extent of impacts. And it's really important to note that because we're able to get down on the beach and see that this foundation of this home was actually completely compromised. Had you gone out at high tide, you probably wouldn't have seen that. You can also see at low tide that we have decking that has been ripped off of some homes. And you can also see the, the beach and dune erosion here as well. So the tide stage is really important when you're going out to report coastal storm impacts. And you can see um, in the photos that it's actively snowing, which corresponds with the information that was pulled from the Weather Service. Now, you can also scroll further and see the highlights of that report from that reporter. So you can see that they did note that the homes that were damaged are on Salt Marsh Road. And you can see all of the impacts, the major impacts to those homes. So there was prior water flow around or under buildings. So that's fair to note. We've got the damaged stairs and decks, siding, walls, roofs, and then also, most importantly, the foundations. There's a note here from this reporter. And there was also evidence of splash over with some further clarification and the beach and dune with clarification as well. So we get a lot of information from these reports. This individual did a really good job of inputting all the information. Now, if you need to reference this report, you can always share the link with other people. You can bookmark it. And then if you're interested in these photos, you can click on a photo thumbnail and you can see the, the full version of it. And the way to download it is actually right clicking on it. And that'll give you the option to either just copy the image directly or to save it onto your computer to, to reference later. Those are the key pieces of information that we wanted to point out with these reports. Now, I'm going to close this report and go back to the previous map. If you want to go look at another location now and you go and zoom out and pan to another location, I want to note that you need to wait for the information to regenerate. 
sometimes during an event, if there's a lot of people using the system, there can be a little bit of a lag. That wasn't too bad. Um, if you need to, there is a reset button down here. And you also can reset using this button on the bottom left under the filters. And if you're taking a while looking at the map, like you have it open while you're doing some other things, you can also check this button here and the map will update as new reports are coming in if you're monitoring a particular location. So that's handy as well. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to wrap up with any remaining questions. Anything? I have a question. Sure, Brian, go ahead. So all the photos that are submitted, uh, can anyone go in there and use them for, you know, any of their presentations, any of their work that they're displaying, whether it be public, private? Yep. Reporters acknowledge that by sharing photos through the system that anybody can use it. We do ask that people acknowledge the MyCoast platform when they are using those photos. You may have noticed when I was going through that example report that there was no identification information on there. We do hide reporters' names. So don't be afraid if you're out reporting that those observations will be attributed to you publicly. That information is hidden on the public side of the, the tool interface. Rebecca and I, as admins though, do have your identification information. It's very essential for us to be able to identify if you're a storm team member or not. And if we have any questions, we need to follow up with you. We will be able to, to reach you. And Chris posted a link in the chat about some, um, some media. So, Rebecca and I would like to thank everyone for attending and sticking through the full hour and a half of the training. We're very happy that Sea Grant asked us to participate in Coastal Resilience Week. We really enjoy these events. And also thank you to Chris and Wes from Blue Urchin for helping us with the tool and um, troubleshooting some things live today. If anyone has any questions after we wrap up, feel free to email Rebecca and myself. Thank you, Julia and Rebecca. I just want to extend a big thank you from Hui C. Grant. Thanks for being part of Coastal Resilience Week. And that was an excellent presentation. You're getting lots of accolades in the chat. If you're not watching, um, everybody really enjoyed the training. So thank you so much. Thank you.